these videos would be a lot easier to do if I didn't know I was doing them. But I do. So there's that. Let's get down to the meat and taters so I don't waste any more of your time or any of mine. Because I am, uh, I never waste time. No, no, not at all. <clears throat> all right then. Carl Jung. Perhaps you're familiar with him. That was kind of loud. Perhaps you're familiar with a psychologist by the name of Carl Jung. We are going to be looking at Carl Jungian psychology as a species of esotericism. Although, it might strike you as odd to point out that I will really be looking at a student of Carl Jung and not so much Carl Jung himself. Make sure that, so I try to make sure the light doesn't bounce off this too much. Uh, it's annoying. But The Origins and History of Consciousness by Eric Neumann. It looks like Newman somewhat. Oh, there's duct tape on that. Sorry about that. Eric New Neumann. Yeah, Origins and History of Consciousness. However, there's a foreword by Carl Jung wherein he showers Mr. Neumann with accolades and commendations and so forth, asserting that he's continuing what where he left off. Neumann is continuing where Jung left off, according to Jung himself. So there's that. Uh, yeah. Now, perhaps you're not familiar with Carl Jung. As I stated already, he was a psychologist and student. I didn't state this part yet. And you may already know, but Carl Jung was a student of Sigmund Freud, the father of modern psychology. And they differed on some <clears throat> pivotal issues about the structure of the mind, the human mind, and the, the forces that impel our behavior that are not directly accessible to our egos. You know, so the unconscious, right? You may be familiar with that, surely, at this point. Although, I guess I don't know who's going to watch this video. Maybe it's like a five-year-old. How? Uh, I, gosh, I hope my language is, is um, squeaky clean. No sort of expletives. I, I'm not sure. But, all right. Anyway, so Carl Jung, student of Sigmund Freud. Fine. Sigmund Freud's ideas are controversial. And while we may not say he was 100% correct, after all, who is? He got the momentum going for modern psychology today, and the importance of the unconscious is still relevant. With Carl Jung, he doesn't appear to be as taken as reputable in academic circles. Even with, and that's not just because he, you know, was around when modern psychology was in its nascent phase. It's really more because he skirts the boundary of what is acceptable. And we may take this, we, we could interpret this several ways. Uh, and this is my experience with, in academia. I, I don't have a degree except in associates, but I, I took courses in psychology uh, and the humanities where I was regaled on the importance of modern psychology, its origins, and all that stuff. And also I've spoken with other people that are that do study psychology and corroborated my suspicion that Carl Jung is not taken seriously in um, the, the, the majority of demographics that comprise the academia of the United States, perhaps even Europe. I spoke with a professor who was mostly involved in folklore, and we were discussing the problem of going native, where a anthropologist or folklorist decides to participate in a specific practice of a culture of an indigenous indigenous tribe, let's say, shamanism, just to make it simple, right? Like, so you go and start participating in the rituals of, of a culture, and maybe you imbibe a psychoactive substance. That's not really... Um, advocated and it could you could lose some prestige so with Carl Jung you have something like that there however I will note um, the well-known psychologist and lecturer Jordan B Peterson as an exception to this he has become a sensation on YouTube if you type in Jordan B Peterson you'll find a lot of videos most of him I mean there could be some debates by him, people even critiquing him, and a lot just of him speaking about various topics. And he will, he's pretty well out in the open about his 
advocacy of Carl Jung. Now, I don't know if this means he's, I doubt he's 100% on board with everything. After all, I mean, even with Neumann, you'll see some differences, surely. Uh, but yeah, what all I'm trying to get at here is Carl Jung is a species of esotericism. We'll be, I'll be showing you how that is so when I look at this book. Carl Jung is not necessarily reputable in academic circles, um, but there may be a change in this since the hierarchy of information and its mediation is being challenged via new technological possibilities, for instance, the immediacy of reaching out to an audience via YouTube. For instance, Jordan B. Peterson, this guy's viral on YouTube. He is a respected psychologist. He has done accredited psychological research. He's worked for universities. Now this guy is going out and speaking his ideas even um, at odds with the administrative culture, for instance, in Canada, he's no longer associated with them. He, I think he, I don't know if he quit or if he lost his job for, you might say, PC reasons, uh, politically correct reasons, although that, uh, that kind of gets a slant to it. I don't necessarily wish to convey. I would rather you come up to your own conclusions. With regard to Jordan B. Peterson's no longer being affiliated with universities. You come to your own conclusions on that. It has to do with uh, personal pronouns, uh, preferred pronouns, things of that nature. Anyway, this guy has a, an audience on YouTube, and it is a formidable audience. Someone like him, who is influenced by Carl Jung's thought, could change the game on how we approach or what our attitude is about someone like Carl Jung and other psychological theories. Um, yeah. Sorry. Anyway, it's important to point out that what, what, techno what technology does to the hierarchy of how information is mediated to an audience. Uh, you see this with Napster. You see this with the Amazon effect. But I'm not going to preach too much about that in this video because it's already 7 minutes and 20 seconds long and I've got to get to the actual substance of this video. So let's do it. All right. Now, you can find the second half of this book online as a PDF, in PDF format. I could not find the first half, which is most of where I got the material from that I'll be reading to you. Typically speaking, I like to demarcate my own voice from another person's voice by citing and stating quote, end quote. Um, although I kind of feel like that's a bit clumsy or it's not good form. I don't know what I'm trying to get at there. But, uh... This is mostly him. He does quote from sources himself. For instance, the Tao Te Ching, which is a seminal Taoist text. I think it's like the Bible of Taoism. He also uh, cites from the Upanishads, which are very <clears throat> core reading, uh, a very uh, a, a compilation of core texts uh, within the Dharma of Hinduism, as we, what we know as Hinduism. And then he also cites from Plato's Timaeus and the Symposium. Uh, yeah. But it's mostly him. So I'm not really good. If I quote, end quote, I'm probably just going to do it when he cites from these texts. But otherwise, it's... I I'm mostly going to just be abbreviating what he says. And, yeah. So, let's get started. Now, I will be connecting this to something Uspensky said, which I pointed out in my video, Freemasonry and Fiction. Uspensky, Uspensky is a noted, a notable esotericist, and he echoes this idea in esotericism that you find in uh, several texts. For instance, uh, Transcendental Magic, as I pointed out. Uspensky, uh, suggestion, Suggestive Inquiry into the Hermetic Mystery by Marianne Atwood, which I'll probably be getting into later. Uh, you see this with the somewhat no notorious esotericist. Julius Savola and the also notorious esotericist slash occultist Aleister Crowley. This idea that mythology conveys in is an attempt to transmit hidden knowledge. Hidden knowledge being something of a synonym for esotericism, the content of esotericism. Knowledge that is not acquired via ordinary means in our waking life. Um, yeah. So, with Jungian thought, you see this analysis of mythology as a projection of unconscious contents in the psyche. 
that they echo some sort of interactivity within our minds that we are not always privy to. And I feel like with these excerpts I have here, I took out some of what he said, not to de not to distort, although I guess in a sense it is a distortion, but just because I'm trying to be a little more succinct, I'm saying that as I'm making a video that's now 10 minutes long, almost 10 minutes, 30 seconds long. But uh, yeah, like I had to pick and choose what I could present. This isn't meant to be a substitute for reading the book itself. I highly recommend you read it. It's dense, it's erudite, but nonetheless, if you're interested in this stuff, uh, I recommend reading it. And if you don't know if you're interested, we're about to read some of it now. Let's get going. Neumann states that Mythology is an attempt to come to terms with something that cannot be apprehended directly by the waking consciousness. And this attempt at what we're grasping towards pertains to the origins of the world in ourselves, our, our self-awareness, our place in the world, where nature comes from, the origin. And that mythology tries to grasp at this in a, in a means that is symbolic. He says here that what is trying to be described is some kind of primordial perfection. Neumann says that this primordial perfection can only be circumscribed, and its nature defies any description other than a mythical one, because that which describes the ego, and what is described, the beginning, which is prior to any ego, prove to be incommensurable quantities. He points out a scholar by the name of Ernst Kasserer, who asserts that creation appears as the creation of light in, I think he says all myths, although I didn't write that down. It's towards the beginning. Uh, if not all myths, yeah, Ernst Kasserer has shown how in all peoples and in, and in all religions, creation appears as the creation of light. Now, I haven't read all myths of creation, so I don't know if that's true, but it is what he states. Um, and so he's trying to look at this idea of the creation of light being synonymous with creation. <clears throat> the coming of consciousness manifesting as light in contrast to the darkness of unconsciousness is the real object of creation, Neumann says. Then he states this, the symbolic story of the beginning is the attempt made by mankind's childlike pre-scientific consciousness to master problems and enigmas which are mostly beyond the grasp of even our developed modern consciousness. If, with resignation, we are constrained to regard the question of the beginning as unanswerable and therefore unscientific, we might be right, but the psyche, which can neither be taught nor led astray by the self-criticism of the conscious mind, always poses this question afresh as one that is essential to it. The logic of consciousness has no value for the psyche and the unconscious. The psyche blends as does the dream. It spins and weaves together, combining each with each. The symbol is therefore an analogy, more an equivalence than an equation, and therein lies its wealth of meaning, but also its elusiveness. <clears throat> One symbol of the original perfection is the circle. Allied to it are the sphere, the egg, and the round of alchemy. Circle, sphere, and round are all aspects of the self-contained, which is without beginning and end, in its pre-worldly perfection. It is prior to any process. It is eternal. For in its roundness there is no before and no after, no time, and there is no above and no below, no space. It is the philosophic world egg, the nucleus of the beginning and the germ from which the world arises. It is also the perfect state in which the opposites are united, the perfect beginning because the opposites have not yet flown apart and the world has not yet begun, and the perfect end because in it the opposites have come together again in a synthesis and the world is once more at rest. <clears throat> uh, then he cites from the Tao Te Ching, quote, There was something formless yet complete that existed before heaven and earth, without sound, without substance, dependent on nothing, unchanging, all-pervading, unfailing, 
one may think of it as the mother of all things under heaven, end quote. Uh, and just as a personal comment on my part, this seems to really touch more upon the feminine aspect, and Norman gets into this idea of primordial perfection being uh, the container of black and white, day and night, heaven and earth, male and female, whereas here we're seeing the primordial feminine aspect of the original perfection. Uh, but there are the world parents, heaven and earth. But then there's the aspect that gives birth to the manifestation of the world, the cosmos, which is conceived as uh, maternal. So that's my own comment there. Then Norman points out this idea of the primordial parents. <clears throat> Any sites from the, I don't think I'll be able to pronounce this correctly, Brihadaranyaka Upanishad. He states the primordial man, Purusha, and cites this aspect of the text. Quote, mm, In the beginning of this world was soul or Atman. In the beginning of the world, there was Atman alone in the form of a person. Quote, In the beginning, this world was the soul or Atman alone in the form of a person. Looking around, he saw nothing else than himself. He said first, I am. And he was as large as a man and a woman closely embraced. He caused, he caused that self to fall into two pieces, and therefrom arose a husband and a wife. End quote. So once again we see an illustration of the primordial state of the soul. In, uh, in the Vedic text it's Atman, which can, there's a lot to say about that, you know, the, the uh, co-identity asserted in certain places in the Upanishads of Atman with Brahman and all that stuff. I'd have to make a video on my own about that alone. We're just going to look at this at this as an illustration of uh, the primordial state containing male and female in itself and these fall into two pieces. The primordial man is apparently androgynous and then this is uh, fragmented into a male and female gender, genders and they are husband and wife of the primordial uh, father and mother of the world or universe. All right, then Norman points out uh, Plato's Timaeus, wherein the universe is construed as a animated organism, an uh, uh, ultimate cosmic, prim uh, cos cosmic being. And therein, uh, the this this universe revolves, has a solitary motion, or is solitary. It, it encompasses all beings, and in itself is the collective intelligence as an identity. Okay, so think about yourselves being a, you're like an organism of, you're an organism, but a community of all these other units that come you you that make you up, but yet you have this solitary sense of identity. In the same sense. Plato in the Timaeus sees, uh, he's, des he's describing the creation of the universe, and the universe is ensouled and has its own identity as such, the totality of all that is manifested. <clears throat> and he describes it as one and solitary, yet by reason of its excellence able to bear itself company and needing no other friendship or acquaintance. It doesn't need eyes, ears, feet, and it moves in a circle, of course, this is I the symbol of the circle as the self-contained, and the universe is described as being sufficient unto itself, needing neither eyes nor ears nor feet, and it can move, it can revolve upon itself. Uh, you can read more about that in the Timaeus if you are interested. He also points out, uh, Norman points out Plato's Symposium, where Aristophanes gives a myth about human beings uh, being originally of three genders, male, female, and a hermaphroditic andro androgen, that uh, and they all they're all actually circular beings where like we have like one half and there's like another half to us and we when we run we run in a circle. Um, he's using this to point out that the primordial state of man is somehow connected to this androgynous state of male and female union, and that this is somehow symbolic of the the primordial state of perfection and so forth. Uh, now, obviously, I'm trying to get at how this is a species of esotericism. Bear with me, and you will see how. 
Um, although I could point it in actually several ways, but I'll, I'll go for the easiest one since this video is already getting lengthy. Now, Neumann states, the perfection of that which rests in itself in no way contradicts the perfection of that which circles in itself. Although absolute rest is something static and eternal, unchanging and therefore without history, it is at the same time the place of origin and the germ cell of creativity. The great round is not only the womb, it is the world parents. The world father is joined with the world mother in primordial union. This is the primal dragon that bites its own tail. It slays, weds, and impregnates itself. It is man and woman, begetting and conceiving, devouring and giving forth, active and passive, above and below, at once. Bear this in mind when we look at, uh, I'm going to be pointing out in another video, I will be examining uh, Julius Savola's text, The Hermetic Tradition, and we'll see a couple ideas that he points out that are the same. <clears throat> Neumann continues, the thinking portrayed in these images of the round endeavor to grasp contents which even our present day consciousness can only understand as paradoxes. If we give the name of all or nothing to the beginning and speak in this connection of wholeness, unity, non-differentiation, and the absence of opposites, all these concepts, if we look at them more closely and try to conceive of them instead of just going on thinking them, they are found to be Instinctively, images derived from these basic symbols of circle, egg, sphere, and round. All these symbols are as alive today as they ever were. They have their place not only in art and religion, but in the psyche, in dreams and fantasies. The primal deity, who is sufficient unto itself, the self who has gone beyond all opposites, will continue to appear in these images. Now, he makes this interesting point how we, we think that consciousness is in, intrinsic to what we are. He makes the argument that, in fact, unconsciousness is the initial state. Consciousness emerges out of unconsciousness. All the automatic processes that constitute our everyday subsistence, the growing of our fingernails, the digestion of, our, of the food we eat, all that is so automatic to us, and we are rooted in that and... and dependent upon that in order for our waking state of analysis to function, okay? So he talks about how ego is, or sorry, consciousness and the ego of it has to be earned. It's a fight. Um, the desire to re remain unconscious, the inertia of reluctance and gravity of resistance to effort is a fundamental human trait. The act of consciousness, cognition, sunders the world into opposites. For experience is only possible through contrast of opposites, precipitating the dynamic tension and struggle of truly individual life. The downward drag of unconsciousness is the natural state. One is primarily unconscious and can at most conquer the original situation in which we drowse in the world. Although there is a counteracting force impelling in the direction as an instinct of sorts to become conscious, the ascent towards consciousness is still the unnatural thing in nature. And so we can feel the strain of our existence as heavy and oppressive, and drowsiness and sleep are felt as delicious pleasure. And then there is the longing for death as a return to the mother, which he describes as a philosophic incest. Bear that in mind when we look at Evola, which is re-entry into the primordial womb the cosmic sea of life and ocean of pleasure. There's this sense of understanding that it is a means also of rebirth and renewal, just as when we go to sleep at night, uh, we wake up refreshed. He makes that comparison. It's a quite apropos one with respect to esotericism. Sleep is uh, symbolically, or at least maybe not just symbolically, but in some sense likened to death. Uh, just as an example, we have Thomas Brown. He existed. He was alive in like ah, 15, 1600s. He was an Englishman or a Welshman, something along those lines. And he says, quote, Sleep is a death, so make me try by sleeping what it is to die, and as gently lay my head on my grave as now my bed, end quote. And so it's something we see quite a bit. And he was, uh, Thomas Brown was very much affiliated with esoteric thinking. You can look him up and see for yourself. Just remember that Brown is pronounced with an E at the end. He's a beautiful writer. Going back to uh, Neumann, 
He states that there is a philosophic incest, which is a return to the primordial womb, but it must be active, not passive. Not a longing to to uh, passively resign oneself to death, but to enter into the the primordial state, actively speaking. Once again, that's important to point out uh, once we look at Julius Evola. Now, I gotta get this to a close. So, we're gonna look at something here, which unmistakably shows that it's about hidden knowledge, otherworldly knowledge. Okay? So, let's look at it. Neumann says that man's consciousness rightly feels itself to be the child of the primordial depths. Emerging from unconsciousness, every night in sleep, rejuvenated, reborn, just as the sun sinks into the horizon to be reborn in the morning. And yet the ego experiences a terrible dread against the terrible power of the dark. Light and consciousness cling together like darkness and unconsciousness. But man has inklings of another, and so he thinks deeper, extra-worldly knowledge. This knowledge is outside and not of this world, a knowing and being in the perfection that comes after death. But it is also pre-conscious in that it precedes the world process. The original wisdom is pre-worldly, prior to the coming of consciousness. But existence after death and the prenatal state are one and the same. The wheel of life and death is the wheel of rebirth, and man's task is to remember with his conscious mind what was knowledge before the advent of consciousness. The regenerative force, the creative magic of the mother leads beyond death. In contrast to the passive oblivion of negative dissolution, the active philosophic incest in achieves a life beyond death. Although the mother bestows life, it can at the same time be mysteriously conditioned by the residual ego nucleus harboring the means of affecting its own resurrection, no longer as a satellite of the unconscious world process, but standing alone and truly independent. This is, again, absolutely absolutely essential to remember when we look at Julius Evola, who is a well-established esotericist, even notorious uh, for his ideas and political thought. So now we're going to look at the last little bit, and it'll be the end, although I'm going to have to turn on the light for this because I had to write all of this down since I couldn't find a PDF format, and I got sick of it. So we're going to look at the very last part, and I'm going to have to read it to you. So let me turn on the light real quick. <clears throat> All right then, the last bit, and then we'll call this one done. All right, so let me see here where it's at. The reality of the soul is one of the basic and most immediate experiences of mankind. It permeates primitive man's whole view of life. We must not forget that the discovery of the objective external world is a secondary phenomenon, the result of human consciousness endeavoring with labor and the help of instruments and abstractions to grasp the object as such independent of the primary reality of man, which is the reality of the psyche. This discovery of the reality of the psyche, especially its creative component, that's me there, uh, corresponds mythologically to the freeing of the captive and the unearthing of the treasure, the primordial, primordial creative powers of the psyche, which in the creation myths were projected upon the cosmos are now experienced humanly as part of man's personality. The reality of all culture, our own included, consists in realizing these images which lie dormant in the psyche. This is a reference to probably the collective unconscious in Jungian thought. This is very important. Listen to this. The self-generating power of the soul is man's true and final secret, by virtue of which he is made in the likeness of God the Creator and distinguished from all other living things. Now he looks at something here. The question as to why mankind reproduces the natural process in its cults and rituals so indefatigably, so passionately, and apparently so senselessly can now be answered. If primitive man holds that the right is responsible for the fruitfulness of the earth and postulates a magical connection between the two, we must surely ask, why does he do this? How does he not realize 
And how does he overlook the apparently self-evident fact that the vegetation continues to grow and that nature can go on perfectly well without him? But it is not true to say that he reproduces nature. Mankind does not, in his magical religious behavior, merely reproduce nature. But by means of an analogous set of symbols, he reproduces in his own soul the same creative process which he finds outside of himself in nature. Please refer back to my video, Freemasonry and Fiction. That's very important. Okay? So he re recapitulates the creative process within nature. Every cultural hero has achieved a synthesis between consciousness and the creative unconscious. This is what the right and through it mankind means. It is knowledge of the creative origin, of the buried treasure which is the water of life, immortality, fertility, and the afterlife rolled into one. And upon this the aspirations of mankind unwearyingly revolve. The constellation of this point is not a reproduction of nature but a genuine creation. And the symbolic recitation of the story of creation at the new year, for instance, has its rightful place at this point. The inner object of the ritual is not the natural process, but the control of nature through the corresponding creative element in man. All right, then. Something for you to consider. Bearing in mind that this is a species of esotericism. There's an extra-worldly, otherworldly knowledge uh, that is the ultimate aspiration of the productions of humankind according to Neumann. This isn't to say that all esotericists agree with him with, on all points, although they might with, agree with him on certain points. They, there might be a nuance there uh, of a different that, that could lead to uh, various I mean, differences, okay, whatever. Sorry, I'm starting to lose myself here. And I was going to point out a few of those. For instance, the idea that uh, mythology is only concerned with the creative component in man and there's not really a true link um, with the macrocosm. Whereas we might explore the possibility that thought can truly establish a link with the, with the external world. We're already attempting to do that really with our mathematics and physical descriptions of world process. But then we could also look at more supernatural means of affecting the, the external world, i.e., Magic, properly speaking. Um, uh, just, just to point out, I'm just going to say that, uh, yeah, like we could look at Kenneth Rexroth and his essay on alchemy, and he critiques the Jungian psycho, psychologi psychological school when they only think that the alchemists are talking about something pertaining to the contents of the human psyche alone. So there's that, there's that distinction. And if you're interested in that, my website, imagination.org. I'll be giving a link to uh, that essay. It's a long essay, but somewhere in there he has that critique of Jung. And then I could also point out something that the well, the, actually not well known, but the very important uh, illuminant Jakob Burma point, uh, states in his alchemical magnum opus, The Signature of All Things. Let's see where it is there. Uh, it's, it's somewhat in code. Um, yeah, he says, if the divine Mercury lives and is manifest in the spirit, then what the spirit of the soul's will imagines into anything, Mercury goes along with it in the imagination and enkindles the Mercury fast apprehended in the similitude of God, with which the living God has made himself manifest. <laughs> but you have to be familiar with Yaka Burma and only I am. That's pretty much it in my neck of the woods. Uh, yeah, so anyway, y'all take care. Till next time.